if the small firm owner is not willing to put in the work, then the tool's not going to work. Business of Architecture, Episode 231. Hello, Architects Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, you can get free instant access to the four part architecture from Profit Map video that I've prepared, especially for podcast subscribers, by going to the website freearchitectgift.com. If you aren't at a computer, you can also text the phrase Profit Map, that's two words, to the phone number 773 770 4377 to get instant access to that. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage Partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects. Peter Drucker famously said, what's measured improves. BQE Core lets you easily measure your key financial performance indicators, and it's dead simple. You can get insights on the profitability of your firm with a beautiful and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm and keep your hard-earned profit. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today, we're going to pick up where we left off last week and talk with business expert Scott Beebe about actual case studies of architecture firm owners who are building a freedom firm, a firm that has real value that can be sold if they choose and that increases their net worth even if they aren't there. So without further ado, here's today's show. Hey, Scott Beebe, welcome back to the business of architecture. Enoch, let's rock and roll, man. So I thought we could talk right now during this episode. I'd like to ask you about some specific case studies of some of the architects that have been through the Freedom Formula program. And to start off with, what are you seeing when firm owners decide to go down this path of getting more freedom in their firm and systematizing the business and putting into place these processes so that it runs smoothly? What what are you seeing that's causing them to make this change in their business and their lives? Enoch, as you well know, the firm owners that come to us, we consider as heroes because the definition of a hero is somebody who takes courageous action based on courageous decision, regardless of the success or the failure. And so when we know that a firm owner is deciding to jump into the AFF program, they're immediately a hero to us because they're, they're, they're taking the hard steps and the hard action. And so what we're hearing when a firm owner shows up is simply this. Hey, Scott, Enoch, I feel like I'm being pulled in 17 different directions. I've got moving parts everywhere. There's fires that I'm putting out every day. I essentially wake up, put out fires, go to sleep, eat, take a shower, wake up, rinse and repeat, do it all over again. It's like Groundhog Day all the time. And even in the best circumstances with small firm owners, maybe they don't feel quite that chaotic, they know that there's this underlying bit of chaos that right now it's controlled, it's managed, but at any moment they feel like it could break open. And that's usually the situation. It's not necessarily a situation where a firm owner feels like, oh my gosh, my business is going to shut down tomorrow. Not that. It's usually they have business, uh, work's coming in, they might be a solopreneur or a small team in a firm that they run, but that one principle holds true. And that is, I just feel chaotic and I need to get out of this chaos so that the business can stop owning me and instead I can start owning the business. So I was talking to an architecture firm owner just the other day, which is a family run business. It's a smaller firm. There's basically the firm owner and his wife. She does the admin and a lot of the project management, office management things in the office. So they're kind of a team running the office. They have two people that work for them. And as I talk with them on the phone, they were talking about some of the goals that they have for the business and some of the things they'd like to change. And there were a couple goals. And I'm going to throw these out there because I'd like to get your opinion on how the framework that you teach can help a firm like this, right? Mm. So first of all, this architect is looking to retire or semi-retire in about 10 years. He probably wants to continue working, die with his boots on, you know, but he wants to be able to slow down in about 10 years. And at that point, he'd like to have someone who he can take over, uh, basically give a, a lot of the responsibility in the firm to where that person can take the firm and run it without him being involved. Okay, that's the mm-hmm. first thing. So more of a long-term plan, 10 years to do that. Mm-hmm. At the same time, he has two employees right now that he's finding that they're not at that level where he would like them to be in terms of producing working drawings, right? Mm-hmm. Some of them, you know, one of them he said is pretty good talking to people, but he's he has expertise in one area of architecture, like kind of 
light commercial stuff, but he's not so good on the residential side. And so he doesn't have a well-rounded person right now who can really step in and take a lot of the delegation things off of his plate. So he feels like he's still spending way too much time reviewing working drawings. He says he's spending, you know, for a typical drawing set that he would normally want to spend 30 minutes on, he's having to spend three hours on it. That's taking tons of time. There's always questions that are happening all the time that are pulling him away from what he's doing. So he, the only time he's getting anything done is on the weekend and at night to try to get things under control. So as we were talking, it was interesting. His wife said, really, Enoch, what's really happening here is he's just not happy because of these things that are happening in his business. So it came down to he wants to do great design and the fires and the little things are causing problems. So let me just summarize here. Don't want to be too long-winded. Number one, he'd like to have a transition plan in about 10 years. Yes. Number two, he'd like to, he, needs, he has a backlog of about five months of work right now, so he needs to bring someone on immediately. And he's wondering whether he brings on an intern who he needs to train or whether he spends the higher dollar amount and brings on someone who is um, ready to go and obviously a much higher pay rate, right? Mm -hmm. And then what things should he consider as he hires them? And then number three is just the day-to-day -day of the little fires that he's dealing with. So I know that's a lot, but I think this scenario is something that our listeners might identify with. How does the Freedom Formula process help an architecture firm owner like this build some value in his business? Yeah. So powerful question. I think I agree with you. It's very common. We hear things like that a lot. So let me take those. I'll take them in order and then we're going to apply them to the architecture firm freedom formula. Let's talk about the transition first. People will ask, well, you know, I want to either transition out of my firm through legacy. I want to send it, you know, to a child of mine or a, a, a family member or something like that, or I want to potentially sell it to uh, the folks that work in the firm, or I might just want to sell out completely. In fact, there are certain markets where we know for certain, because we've got people in our group that this is happening to right now, that in certain markets, there is a large scale buyout of all architecture firms or small architecture firms. So it's not unusual if you're right placed in the right market and to be thinking through this. The worst thing you can do in terms of thinking about transition is nothing at all. The worst thing you can do is not write anything down. Uh, you know, we quote this all the time, Enoch. Uh, Michael Gerber says, if you don't write it down, you don't own it. And the other quote that we use is, write the vision down so that those who read it may run. If you want to transition some way, and just a little hint, all of you are going to transition at some point. Uh, it's just a biological fact. If you want to transition well, You've got to write down the plan, period. Hands down, no questions asked. There's no way around it. There's no magic sauce, special cheese, nothing. You have to write the plan down. Now, the beauty of the AFF program is we walk you and help create the discipline of writing every single thing down. We help you write down vision story, write down delegation roadmap, write down team meeting agenda structure, weekly schedule. 12-week uh, plan, all of those things, we actually have you write them down, not necessarily with a pen, uh, but document them in some form, usually uh, with a in, in digital format, but you can certainly write them down with pen. When you begin to document them, all of a sudden they become real. And so, uh, you know, the iPhone was just a vision at some point in somebody's mind. My guess is it's Steve Jobs, but it, at some point they actually had to document what was going on, submit it to the patent office, get a patent, and then diagrammatically draw out what the phone looks like. If you want to transition, you've got to document the transition plan. Now, the actual details of the transition, they're not as important. And obviously, an attorney can help you with that. But they're not as important as you think they are in terms of, I don't know what I'm going to say. Just say what you think. You know, uh, you know, Enoch, you and I wrote down a statement of intent a couple of years ago about how you and I would work together. I I've never written one down. I don't know that you'd ever written one down. But we designed it around what we thought would be best in the relationship. And that's the way you've got to get started from a transition plan standpoint. So that's number one, the transition plan. Enoch, does that make sense? Yeah, to summarize, it sounds like you're really starting with creating that vision so that that transition plan actually happens. Is that an accurate statement? 100%. Because where there is no vision, people scatter. And where there is no transition plan, there's no communication. And so if you want scattering to happen, we had a small business owner uh, two and a half years ago one parent died of the family business about six years ago. The second parent was still living and then died and had a two-year heads up on the death because of a, of a terminal uh, disease illness that they had, that they had uh, procured. And so in that, 
They never wrote down the transition plan, and it has created two and a half years of living hell for the family members that are remaining. Really, really bad. If they would have had a vision in place, they would have at least known where the intention of the business was supposed to go so that they could have divvied that up. But the vision is definitely where everything needs to start. So let's talk about the backlog that you mentioned. A lot of backlog. Do, do I hire? Do I hire somebody new? Do I hire somebody who's got professional everything? Do I hire? Just remember this. Whoever you hire, the more rock star they are, the more baggage they bring with them. All right? So the more rock star they are, the more baggage they bring with them. The greener they are, the more training they're going to require. Now, everybody requires a lot of training, even the rock star. The problem is the rock star is more prone not to receive your training because hint, hint, they're a rock star. <laughs> and so if they've already been termed a rock star, then they don't need your training, at least in their own mind. We all know they do, but in their own mind, they don't because they think just because they were great at Revit at the other firm, they're going to be great at Revit at your firm. And that's not true because the way that the one firm does Revit doesn't necessarily mean that's the way the other firm does Revit. We see this all the time in the administrative functions of small firms is you'll get somebody who's been doing QuickBooks at one firm and they'll be a rock star, 20-year vet in QuickBooks. They'll go to another firm, and they will be a disaster. And the reason is because they know how to do QuickBooks the way they did it, not the way the new firm does it. So I'm not as interested in experience as much as I am in can you follow our process? Can you do Revit the way we do it? Can you do construction drawings the way we do it? And if you can follow our process, that's the person I'm more prone to hire. And so there's a couple of things in play when you're looking at hire. And again, we talk about a lot of this in the AFF program. One is writing down the role. What is the role that you're hiring for? And if you do not have a role written down, please don't hire. Save yourself the headache and save the person you're about to hire the embarrassment. Because so, if you Scott, I'm just, how is a role different than a job description? Yeah, great question. So they're pretty much one and the same. Again, let's go back to what we were just talking about with the vision and the, the kind of the uh, transition documents and all of that. The role or the job description is nothing more than an explanation of what you need that role to function in, in the firm. And so don't go to Google and search, uh, well, I need a design role. And so let me go Google a design role. No, 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 no. Somebody else's design role is not necessarily what you need them to do. So sit down with a sheet of paper and think through every detail of what you need a person to do to fulfill that role. And then don't give it a title until you're done writing it. Don't say this is a design role and then you write the role and it really kind of has something to do with design and kind of doesn't. You want to write the role out and you can even call it a job description and then you want to title that role. But when you go to recruit, don't talk about the title of the role because if I tell you I'm looking for a design person, you and I have different definitions of that. Talk about the role itself. What's the descriptives in the role? And when you go to ask people, hey, do you know somebody who can do what? The title? or the role. I want to know what the specs of the role are because that's going to be more specific and you're more than likely to find somebody who's narrowly focused on that element. So to answer the question, Enoch, would I go after somebody with huge experience or would I go after somebody who's trained? Who I would go after is the person who's ready and excited to follow the role and follow the processes within the role. That's who I would go after. How would you, so let's go back to our case study example here. This particular architect, he's kind of wondering, do I hire someone now who has the potential to be a firm leader? Because what he's finding is that the current people, he's just worried that he can't train them up to the level of being a firm leader. Now, not ever, do you believe that anyone can lead a firm or do you believe that there's certain characteristics that people should be looking for in that, that kind of leadership position? I think just about anybody who's got the desire to lead the firm and who is willing to learn to lead can lead the firm. That's, that's who I believe can lead the firm. Again, there are other firm leaders who shouldn't be leading firms. Now they have the title, but they don't have the desire and they don't have the capability. And so I'm, I'm convinced that anybody who's got the desire, who's got baseline capability competency, but who is willing to learn the system can lead the firm. So let's look and say, all right, if somebody doesn't lead the firm, this is where you've got to go back to vision mission, and values. And again, in the AFF program, we walk through each one of those very granular, granularly so that when you come to this decision, you can decide, hey, I've got a person in play who's got less experience, but they've got passion towards our vision. They fit. They've got, they understand our mission, so they know what gets us out of bed every morning and it aligns with them. 
and they're tied into our core values versus somebody who's got 20 years of experience and they kind of want to do their own thing. So when I look at those two profiles, I want the person that's going to fit the vision, the mission, the values. And then I've got to ask those two questions. Hey, do you have a desire to lead a firm one day? And if the answer is a resounding yes, my second question is, are you willing to follow our process to a T, fix it when it's broken, but follow it to a T to the point where it's driving to where our vision is going? And do you even want to go where our vision is? Scott, how do you ascertain as an employer, someone who's looking to bring on someone, how do you find out if they're truly willing to follow your process? They could tell you anything. How do yeah. you safeguard against bringing someone on board who says they are, but they're not really that kind of person? You know, Enoch, it's one of the most underutilized tools that we've seen in hiring and architecture firms. It's a contracted project. And so when you're looking to hire a person, the beauty of architecture is there's a lot of contract work that can go on, design work, those sorts of things, projects that you can look at. And so what you do is you contract a person before you hire them for a day or a couple of hours or a week to actually work on a project, either current or past project. And so go ahead and contract the, uh, the, the person you're looking at and saying, hey, we're going to put you on a contract while you're working your other job. So you can moonlight this if you want. You can do it on the week. We don't care when you do it. But it's a project. We're going to pay you for the project. And we want you to go in and, for instance, we want you to design these walls. But we want you to follow our process to design these walls. We've got it processed out. Here's a video or written, written document. So you design these walls based on our process, and we're going to pay you for it. It is one of the most underutilized, most powerful tools that people have before you hire someone. Because if you hire them, you're kind of marrying them for a little bit. And it's going to be ugly if it doesn't work. And so just date a little bit, court <laughs> in that vernacular. And you can do that through simple, simple uh, contract projects. Awesome. So let's talk about some of the successes and the way that architecture firms' lives, uh, owners or principals or partners, how their lives can be changed by going through this process. Because at the end of the day, we have personal lives, we have goals, we have aspirations. So let's talk about what are some of the successes you've seen from people applying these things? Enoch, I, I don't know that you and I would be doing this if it didn't directly impact the lives of people. Um, I know you and I both have a passion that life, business, it's all connected. And so we're not just interested in people doing well in their business and growing in profits and all that kind of stuff. There's a whole life behind the work. And that's what we're really interested in. And we realize that business is a great avenue in order to get to that point. So one of the most powerful stories we've seen is an architect in the southeastern part of the United States runs a, a, a nice little firm, uh, less than eight uh, team members in a smaller market town. And they've run this firm for 20 plus years, over two decades that they've been running this firm. One of the elements that we talk about in the AFF program, we actually get pretty knee deep into the financial side of a small firm and setting things up structurally so that you can finally start to not only see a profit on your net income statement, but to actually see it in cash in a bank account. And this is a successful small firm owner, by the way. This is somebody that you would highly respect, and you know who this is, but uh, I'm talking about architects, would highly respect at any conference you go to. This particular firm owner had never made a, uh, a, a noticeable cash-bearing profit in 23 years. Paid salaries, paid all that stuff, sometimes went on a little vacation and you know ran it through the business and things like that but it never gotten to December 31st of any year in 20 plus years. And there was extra cash that had no destination to it. This year, he just started this actually in uh, midsummer. By the end of this year, he will have roughly $28,000 in what we call destinationless profit. <laughs> He's already spent on taxes. He's already spent on salaries. He's already spent on overhead. He's already spent on reinvestment in the business. He spent on everything. There's nothing more he can spend to operate his business. And this is 28, I think it was $28,000 of destinationless cash in the business that he's actually going to be able to have there to invest in things like college uh, savings, to invest in things like 401ks and, or um, IRAs and, and those sorts of things. That was a really powerful win for a small firm owner. 
and just with dollars and cents. That's not to mention all the other freedom that's going to come with that. Okay, well, that's a pretty incredible success story. Exactly what did this architecture from owner do to achieve that? We don't need to get into the nuts and bolts, but if someone's listening and they want to apply this and they think, hey, that sounds good, what would they, you know, how, how did he make that happen? It's so simple. And Enoch, just behind the statement of it's so simple, again, it's so underutilized. And so I'll lay it out. Essentially, you go to your bank, you open up five bank accounts instead of one or two, and in those five bank accounts, you name them, literally name them on the account. So when, when you and I pull up our online bank accounts, we can see I've got an account named income, an account named tax, an account named profit. And so we've got these five bank accounts. Actually, I've got more than that set up uh, because of how we divvied some things up. And so you essentially go open five bank accounts. Your operating account that you currently have could be one of those. That's fine. And every dime that comes into the business goes into one account. That's it. And then every couple of weeks, you flush that account in a defined percentages to the other four accounts that are there. So let's say you wanted to, to stuff away 6% of profit of every dime that comes into the business. That's every dime that comes into the business. You're profiting 6%. Then you set that account up at 6%. So every two weeks, you're going to take 6% of that income account, and you're going to flush it into what you call your profit account. Then you've got another account called tax. You're going to take, let's say, 15%, and you're going to flush it into the profit account. Then you're going to take your owner's compensation account. You're going to flush a defined percentage in there. And then you're going to take your operating expense account and to flush a defined percentage there. Now, we've got rules and how you set up the percentages and how you do all of that stuff. But the bottom line is, Enoch, it's super simple. It's kind of like Dave Ramsey's financial cash envelopes that a lot of people have heard about but it's digital, it's using your bank accounts, and it's really defined just for business and how it's laid out. So we walk firm owners through that. Um, and we are, well, we've, we've become less and less amazed at how successful it is because it's happening so often. Okay. Tell me another success story that you've seen, and then let's dive into what that firm owner did to achieve that. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got uh, a great architect who is in uh, kind of central Eastern Europe, and uh, been a great firm owner to work with, been very passionate uh, about what he's doing. And he really dove into the AFF process, work in his process, has built out his vision story, his delegation roadmap, he's got his accounts set up, started implementing the team meetings under our structure, the non-negotiable weekly schedule, 12-week goals, everything. And then he showed up on one of our calls, Enoch, and this was so memorable. And in his, in his uh, very understandable and yet thick, kind of exotic Central Eastern European accent, he said, for the first time, I'm sitting here on this call and I'm not stressed. He said, normally I would have to miss this call. We have a massive deadline due tomorrow. And everybody in my firm is working as diligently in there as they can. But I'm here on this call because I've got it all delegated at this point. And so he said, for the first time, we've got these huge projects that are being done, and I'm not working on them. Our team's got them. I'll give a final review at a defined time, but our team's got that taken care of. And he was able to sit on our call completely stress-free and think about the next step that he needs to be taking as a firm owner. That was a powerful, powerful moment. Awesome. Hey, I just want to take a quick break here, Scott. If anyone's listening and they want to find out more about the process that Scott's talking about, if they want to hear more about these case studies, uh, Scott and I have prepared a free AIA-approved educational session where you can go learn about these things. It's about a 60-minute session, and you can sign up for that. It's an online class. You go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. So, I mean, yeah, that struck me. That was pretty cool. I remember that was Davor who said that, and he was pretty, uh, we were all pretty impressed when he said, yeah, I've never been able to <laughs> be hanging out like this on a call like this uh, when I have a deadline tomorrow. Another person who's really gotten, so there are people who come to the program because they're dealing with a lot of fires and they feel like they want to get things under control because it's encroaching on other areas of their life. And they realize that they're at risk because if they get hit by a bus, everything will fall apart, their family will suffer. And so they realize they need to get out of that. There's other people like Mel, who's been a rock star in the program, who already has a well-functioning mid-sized firm. They do amazing work. They're well-known, well-respected, but she wants to scale it and she has plans to take it to the next level and really help more clients and more people. So talk to me about how 
um, Mel, and I know if anyone's listening, we're going to talk more about these case studies if you go to that webinar. But what changes have you seen in that kind of scenario with there's multiple partners in the firm, they already have staff running, you know, how does this process help a firm like that, that already has quite frankly, a lot of it's running great, they're making profit, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a classic example of chaos is stirring underneath. Um, and and I'm glad you brought up Mel. Mel's been such a delight uh, to work with. Mel's actually got a partner in the firm. Uh, they've got multiple people, as you said, uh, large projects that they're working on. So they're going to be a, a larger firm uh, than you know somebody who's running say a half a million or seven or excuse me, ha yeah, half a million or seven hundred fifty thousand or a million. They're going to be a little bit larger than that. Um, now, with that being said, one of the things that Mel has done, and this is this is going to be more about the spirit of the program than it is necessarily going to be the tools of the program. And so here's the reality, Enoch, is we know the tool that we've built in the AFF program is dynamite. We know it. We've seen it work over and over and over again. I don't feel awkward saying that. Um, you know, if I walked up to LeBron James and said, hey, are you good at basketball? I hope he's going to tell me yes, because that's what he does. He's great at it. And so we own that. We own that we've built something that's really good. And yet at the end of the day, Enoch, we've seen this. If the small firm owner is not willing to put in the work, then the tool's not going to work. And Mel came in, and you could tell from day one she was ready to put in the work. She set up meetings with her partner. She set up meetings with her CPA to talk about the bank accounts. She set up meetings with key leaders within the firm to talk about their team meeting structure and their new weekly schedule. And she has done everything that we have asked her to do. The story of Mel is a story of putting in the work. It's a story of showing up. And so there's nothing magic about the AFF program. We have built a world-class program. There's no doubt about it. We have literally served architects around the world and they've seen transformation if they've implemented. We have also worked with architects that have not seen transformation as hard as it is for us to say that. And it's usually because, well, it's always because it just hasn't been implemented. And so with Mel, the story of Mel is straight up implementation, hustle. She's going to get to a moment where she's going to reach the pinnacle of that mountain that she's climbing. And you know what's going to happen? She's going to enjoy that mountain for a little bit. And then she's going to see another mountain, another challenge that she wants to climb. But the good news is she will have a firm that will be running behind her while she climbs that next mountain. And so if you're an architect that wants to continue to climb, that you enjoy the challenge, you enjoy next things, even if the challenge is not necessarily more architecture work, but it's another challenge of serving somebody. Guys, I, 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 this is the one thing, Enoch, I really want to pull out. Our goal should never be to build a big firm, sell the thing, make a bunch of money, and go play golf for the rest of our life. Because the reality is I've met a, guy, a lot of guys like that, and they're not happy. They're not happy. The reality of life should be the opportunity to take the skill set that we've been given and serve people with it. That doesn't mean you have to serve them with architecture day and night, but it does mean you have the opportunity to be able to serve people in a lot of different aspects, but some of you are so married to the business and the chaos that's burning inside of it that you don't have the opportunity to go serve things outside of that. And so that's really the story of Mel. In fact, what was it? I think about two months ago, Mel called us. She lives in Virginia, but she called us from Italy because her husband and uh, she and her husband had an opportunity to go to Italy, check in with the firm but they had an opportunity to be re remote. So she got to enjoy Italy because she knew that things at home were in process. They had their accounts set up, their meetings, everything was working out perfectly well because of how she had set it up and the grunt work that she put in. Yeah, that's so it's Mel Price that we're talking about. She's uh, one of the owners of Work Program Architects based out just outside of D.C. So the last story that kind of came to mind, Scott, that I'd like to ask you about is our good friend, well, you know, Mr. RV, right? So Dan Shear. <laughs> so this was an architect who, he has an RV, and it's a nice RV, and he likes to travel around. He likes to experience the beautiful uh, countryside of North Carolina. Is that where he's at, North Carolina or South, South Carolina? Carolina? South Carolina. Okay, so he's in South Carolina, and now he's at a point where he can just touch in, like come into the to the office a couple times a week, if that, and the firm functions. He has a couple employees. It's it's a firm under 10 people. What was it that, that Dan did, Scott, yeah. that allowed so, him to create that kind of freedom 
where uh, very few architects would feel comfortable being able to be away from the office that much. And they might not want to, granted. Uh, but what was it that he specifically did that allowed him to do that, do you think? Yeah. So Dan's unique. Dan's a quiet hustler. You know, there were some calls where Dan would be on and we're like, man, I, is Dan engaged? Is he, is he in? Uh, and lo and behold, one day, I'll never forget this. He called us and he was sitting outside in the woods. <laughs> we're like, man, man, where are you at? And he turned his camera around and he showed us his RV. And he said, I'm working. I said, like, what do you mean you're working? And he said, I'm working. And I said, all right, I explain it a little bit more. And he said, well, I mean, I've been doing everything y'all told me to do. And we're like, oh, okay. And I said, so what did that lead to? And he goes, I'm working out right outside of my RV in the middle of the woods. And we're like, oh my gosh, like the quiet hustler. He had been hustling, fooling us behind the scenes the whole time. And then all of a sudden he shows one day and he's outside and he and his family had made a commitment because of the processes they put in place. He and his family had made the commitment to travel around the state of South Carolina and in uh, a state he grew up in and tour the state so he could learn about the history of the state. It's an opportunity he would have never had had he not taken the tools from the AFF program and implemented them. And so he, he was a quiet hustler. He implemented those. And then one day he shows up on our call and he's sitting outside of an RV and he's working. And then he, when he's done with us, he said, I'm going to shut my laptop and I'm just going to go walk the woods for a little bit. It was such a, a visual story, Enoch, for you and I to be able to see the power of implementation of the AFF program. And what exactly did he implement to be able to achieve that? I want to dig into that. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is really crucial. So what Dan really crushed was the process. So we preach process, process development. We've even added some things since Dan was in the program around process mapping. So now our architects, when they leave our program, they will have a full process map. All of their process is titled out on one sheet of paper. So if somebody ever came and said, hey, I want to buy your firm, they could show them that sheet of paper and go, hey, here's our whole firm on, on one map. Dan really crushed the process. He began to build processes based on the maps that we had laid out and helped him lay out in the AFF program and took those processes and then began to delegate those, not abdicate. There's a difference. And we talk about that. Abdication is just saying, hey, here, do this. Delegation is saying, hey, I've written this out or I've videoed the process for you. And now I want to walk you through this and, and uh, train you as you do it. And then I'm going to uh, get into an aspect where all I'm doing is uh, overviewing what you've done. And then you're going to be off on your own. Dan did that so well. And it has paid off for him because it's given him the freedom that he came into the program for. All right, cool. Now, Scott, I know that you run a podcast as well. Where can people go to find out more about your work and some of the great stuff you're doing? Yeah, man. So we run a coaching podcast. So every time I get off of a call or out of a client meeting, I turn on the podcast mic and I take you inside the meeting. So if you just go to the Business on Purpose podcast, or you can go to my business on purpose dot com forward slash podcast. You can find it there. And uh, if you need some coaching throughout the week, uh, we usually upload anywhere from three to four a week. And you can get that there at the Business on Purpose podcast. Awesome. Well, Scott, thanks for being on the show. You know, you have the, the moniker, you, you help liberate uh, architecture for owners from the chaos of working in their business. And if anyone's listening, maybe you're an employee at a firm and you think, man, this is something that my employer could really use. We could use around here. You know, send them to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. That'll kind of start you down that path to figure out what this is about. And perhaps this program will be right for you. In any case, Scott, thanks for joining us today. And thanks everyone for listening. Thanks, Enoch.